Tonight I want to talk to you about the God who loves and forgives. Let's pray. Father, we know that you're with us here. You've told us when two or more would gather together in your name, you would be there in the midst of them. And Lord, I pray tonight that you will speak to people and that they will find the hope they're looking for, that they will hear your voice and they will come to believe in you before this night is over. We commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Years ago I used to have a dog. He was a German Shepherd. His name was Erlo. He came pre-named. Best dog I've ever owned. I love that dog. So I was taking him out for a walk one evening and, <clears throat> excuse me, and so a cat ran by. Now I don't want to say that I encouraged my dog to chase the cat, but let's just say I didn't exactly discourage him. The cat ran off and I said, get him, Erlo. <laughs> off Erlo goes, chasing the cat. They're going down the street, I'm watching, and suddenly the cat stops, just stops. And Erlo stops. And the cat lifted up its tail. I thought, what kind of a cat is this? Then I heard this sound, something like this. And I noticed that cat had a white stripe down his back. That wasn't a cat, that was a skunk. And it was a direct hit on Erlo's face. Erlo turns around and he starts running toward me. And I'm running from Erlo because I want to get back in my house. My front door's open. I want to get to the house and shut the door before he comes in because he'll stink up my entire house. I'm running. He's running. He passes me, goes through the house. I put him in the backyard. He's just rolling around trying to get the smell off. The whole house smelled like a skunk. It was so bad it woke my wife up from a dead sleep. And my wife has a supersonic nose, so she really noticed it. It took him a long time to get that scent off of him of the skunk. Maybe you've come in here tonight with a heavy load of guilt. You've tried to get rid of it. You try to talk yourself out of it. You say, you know, it isn't real. It, it's not really something I have to concern myself with, but you know it's real. You try to minimize it, but there it is hanging over you. Listen, if the story of Michael Franzese doesn't tell you anything else, it tells you this, God can change even you. God can forgive you of every sin you have ever committed because the Bible says with God all things are possible. Let me tell you something. Guilt is not always a bad thing. Guilt is a symptom of a deeper problem and the deeper problem is sin. You feel guilty because you've sinned. It means your conscience is working. Sometimes you have to feel bad before you can feel good. Jesus said, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. Or a more modern translation puts it this way, happy are the unhappy for they will be happy. <laughs> First you have to see your real condition and your conscience is telling you something is not right. Years ago we used to have a, a smoke alarm on our ceiling and it was the most overly sensitive smoke alarm I've ever seen. My wife would cook up, cook up a scrambled egg and it would go off and I'd have to pull the broom out of the closet and push the little button. It was ridiculous. You couldn't cook anything in the kitchen because of this overly sensitive smoke alarm. One day it went off. I couldn't take it anymore. I climbed up on a stool. I ripped it out of the ceiling. That was the end of it. Don't do that to your heart. If your heart is working, if you're feeling bad about some things that you've done, that's a good indication. Because here's the bottom line. Every one of us have sinned. What does it mean to sin? A sin means to cross a line. The Bible speaks about being dead in your trespass in sin. Maybe you've walked by a park and you saw the little sign that said no trespassing. And you went over the line. That's what it is to sin. You cross the line. God has given us absolute standards for right and wrong. They're called the Ten Commandments. And I love how people say, I live by the Ten Commandments. That's all the religion I need. You respond, really? Can you name the Ten Commandments? Um, thou shalt, uh, uh, no. <laughs> and you live by them? 
And here's the bottom line. Nobody lives by the Ten Commandments. We've broken them. So we've crossed the line. And then we have fallen short of God's standard, which is perfection. So we've all sinned. And hence we have guilt. But here's the good news. No matter what sin you have committed tonight, I want you to know that God can forgive it and remove it from you forever. You can leave Angel Stadium a different person on the inside than the one you came in as. Have you ever lost anything in the ocean? Pretty much you can kiss it off. You're probably never going to see it again. Years ago I was out scuba diving and I went out and I was cruising along and I could see the bottom there and it was, I was down about maybe 15 feet and the floor was about 30 feet and, and I went out a little farther. I stayed at about 30 feet. Now the floor of the ocean is about 60 feet. I go out a little further. The floor of the ocean is about 80 feet. I'm still at about 30 feet. Then I come to this one ledge and it drops off and I can't see the bottom of the ocean. I'm still at the same depth. But I looked down there and it freaked me out and I turned around and went back the other direction. See, that's a long ways down. If you drop something down there, you'll never see it again. Here's what the Bible says. God will take your sin and, th and throw it into the deepest part of the sea. He'll take our iniquities and cast them into the depths of the ocean and then God promises, your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Isn't that good news? God will forgive your sin. He'll forget your sin. Listen, we should not choose to remember what God has chosen to forget. Our God is a big eraser. So when we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, remember that horrible sin I committed, God will just say, hey man, forget about it. It's forgiven. It's forgotten. It's behind you. The Bible tells a story of two thieves on the cross. They were there being crucified on the same day that Jesus was. And by the way, the word thief that is used in the Bible is a much more intense word. They weren't just guys that stole stuff. These guys were probably murderers and insurrectionists uh, revolting against Roman tyranny. We might call them terrorists today. That's why Rome would hang people like that on crosses. So here's this thief hanging on a cross and next to him was Jesus Christ. That thief was hanging there because of his own sins. Jesus was hanging there because of the sins of others. And there's Jesus hanging and the crowd begins to mock Christ and they say he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the chosen of God. And both thieves joined in this chorus of mockery and then Jesus said something that blew one of those thieves' minds. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that guy looked at Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You realize that? He believed right on the spot. You know how long it takes to become a Christian? Well, let me illustrate. How long does it take you to snap your fingers? Let's all snap right now on the count of three. One, two, three. Hey, that sounded cool. Let's do that just one more time. One, two, three. That's how long. You can believe in Jesus that quickly. It doesn't take a year. It doesn't take a month. It doesn't take a week. It can happen in an instant. Maybe it's already happened to you. You've said, I believe this. God can change you just like that. Just where you say, I understand that Jesus loves me and he came to die on the cross for me. See, that man was hopeless up to that point, but he found hope. And then Jesus says to him, truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And you want to talk about being at the right place at the right time. Can you imagine how his heart must have leapt for joy? Have you lost hope tonight? We've all heard about the tragic suicide of comedian and actor Robin Williams. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more tomorrow night. But this is a man who lost hope and was so despondent despite his fame and despite his fortune and despite all the things that he had. He ended his life. Have you lost hope? Maybe some of you have come in here and you've thought about suicide. Some of you have even attempted suicide. It's been said that man can live 40 days without food, three days without water, about eight minutes without air, but only one second without hope. 
Listen to me. Jesus Christ can give you hope tonight just like he gave to that thief on the cross 2,000 years ago. Now that guy had what we might call a deathbed conversion. You say, man, I'll wait till my deathbed and then I'll believe. I'll party, have fun, break all the rules. And then when I'm, you know, 10 minutes from death, I'll believe in Jesus. What makes you think you will have the luxury of a deathbed conversion? Sometimes death comes without warning. The Bible says it's appointed unto a man once to die and then comes the judgment. We're in a baseball stadium here tonight, aren't we? And I heard a story about two guys who were big baseball fans, probably the biggest baseball fans in America. All they talked about was baseball. It was John and Josh, baseball, baseball, baseball. So they made a deal with each other. They said, if one dies before the other, he would tell the other who was still on earth if there was baseball in heaven. Well, sure enough, one of them died. John passed away in his sleep one evening. So Josh was waiting for news and about a week went by and he hears the voice of John from the other side. And John says, I'm here, man, it's fantastic. And Josh says, well, you gotta answer the question. Is there baseball in heaven? John says, well, I've, I've got some good news and bad news about that, Josh. Yeah, what's the good news? The good news is there is baseball in heaven. And then Josh says, well, what's the bad news? And John says, you're pitching Friday night. Now that's a joke, not even a funny joke. But it illustrates how life can end unexpectedly. This could be your last opportunity to get right with God. But I really want to talk about another man that was in many ways one of the most evil men who ever lived. He was a heavy duty sinner. The man I want to talk about murdered many people. He tortured others. No, he was not a member of La Cosa Nostra. He was not a made man or a good fella, but he was just as bad, if not worse. This man was known as Saul, and he came from the town of Tarsus. Ironically, Saul of Tarsus was a religious man who was part of an elite religious group called the Sanhedrin. They were sort of like the Supreme Court of their day. They made rulings that affected the whole nation. But Saul made it his business to hunt down followers of Jesus and put them to death. And by the way, persecution is alive and well in our world today. We've all heard about this group in Iraq called ISIS. They're hunting down Christians, torturing them, even crucifying them. It's hard to believe it's happening in the 21st century when these ISIS terrorist group members find the home of a believer. They put an N on the home in Arabic, N, and it stands for Nazarene because these people follow the Nazarene. So here was Saul 2,000 years ago hunting down followers of the Nazarene. And one day a man was brought before him who was fearless. He was young and his name was Stephen. And Stephen got up in front of Saul and all these other Sanhedrin religious dudes and he began to lay the gospel out without any shame or fear. And as he spoke, they got really angry. In fact, they were so angry, they put their fingers in their ears and they started screaming. Hey, listen, you know your message is not going over well when people do that. But Stephen kept speaking and the Bible says his face shined like an angel and the command was given to execute him by stoning. And as the rocks were hurtled at Stephen's young body, he cried out, Lord, don't lay this sin against them. Don't charge them with this sin. Sounds just like Jesus on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And this just enraged Saul that somebody could die like that. But here's the bottom line. Death for the believer is not the end. It's just the continuation of it in another place. Stephen was not afraid to die. Are you afraid to die? Death's gonna come. The statistics on death are pretty impressive. One out of every one person will die. Now that does mean, not mean that Christians walk around with some kind of a death wish saying things like, Man, I hope I die today. That would really be cool. 
No, I don't think anyone loves life more than a Christian. And you know what's great? We don't need drugs. We don't need alcohol to make life fulfilling. We have a relationship with God. But when that day comes, and it will, we're ready. As the Apostle Paul said, by the way, Saul of Tarsus became the Apostle Paul in case you didn't know that. But the Apostle Paul said to live as Christ and to die as Cain. That's the hope of the follower of Jesus Christ. Listen, only those who are prepared to die are really ready to live. So Saul, after watching Stephen die so courageously, goes on a rampage of hunting down Christians. And I think it's because God's Holy Spirit was working on him. You know, sometimes the people that argue the most may be closer to the kingdom of God than those that are passive and nice about it. Maybe you came here tonight to laugh at Christians. Maybe you came here because someone invited you and you say, okay, I'll go, but I'm just telling you right now, I'm never gonna become one of those born agains. <laughs> I used to be that person. I thought Christians were losers, idiots, misfits. One day I went to one of their meetings, kind of. It was on my high school campus and they were having a little Bible study. So I sat down close enough to check them out so I could laugh at them, but, but I was far enough away where people wouldn't think that you know I was joining up with them. And as I watched them, I thought to myself, look at these stupid people. Look at their silly smiles. Listen to their lame songs. Too bad they can't be cynical and angry like me. And then I tried a new thought on first eyes. I thought, what if, of course it's not true, what if, what if they're right? What if they have really have met God? What if Jesus really lives inside of them? Oh, that couldn't be true, I thought. But I tried the thought on first eyes. Have you done that yet? But I thought, but see, I could never become a Christian. I'm not the religious type. I'm not Mr. Goody Two Shoes, you know. I'm, I'm like the cynic. I'm the mocker. I'm not gonna become a Jesus freak. But there was something pulling on my heart. And a guy got up to speak, and I don't remember much of what he said, but I remember one statement. He said, Jesus said, you're for me or against me. And I looked at those Christians, and I thought, well, they're definitely for him. I'm not one of them. Does that mean I'm against him? And that was the day I gave my life to the Lord. And this can be the night you give your life to the Lord as well. He'll forgive you of whatever sin you've committed. He's calling you. He'll transform you. But Saul was driven by hatred for Christians. Maybe you're driven by hatred right now. Listen, Stephen didn't reach a lot of people, but he reached one. He reached Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul. So that was one whopper of a convert. Maybe a Christian has gotten your attention. There's something about their life that got you thinking. Michael Franzese largely came to faith because of the life of his wife, Cammie. And then, of course, another friend of mine whose name is Lee, used to be the legal editor for the Chicago Tribune. His wife became a Christian. That ticked Lee off because Lee was an atheist, and that didn't fit in with his lifestyle. So being a legal editor, being a super smart guy, he decided he was gonna disprove over the weekend the newfound faith of his wife. And his research led him to this conclusion, everything she believed is true, and Jesus Christ was the Lord. And so Lee committed his life to Christ. Oh, by the way, you probably know Lee better as Lee Strobel, one of the leading apologists in the church today. So here's Saul. There's no way he's ever going to become the believer, but he is, as we see in the story. Here's what Acts chapter 9 says. Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the followers of Jesus. He wanted to bring them back to Jerusalem and change as he was approaching Damascus on his mission. A light fell from heaven and he fell to the ground. And Saul heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul says, who are you, Lord? And the voice replied, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Saul was driven by hate. This reminds me of another friend of mine, Raul Reese. 
Raul Reese was a Vietnam vet. He came back from the war and he was angry. And one night he decided he was gonna kill his wife and his sons. So he was waiting at home with them with a loaded shotgun waiting for them to return. And as he was sitting there in his front room he turned on the television set and saw some guy on TV talking about the love of God. That man's name, by the way, was Pastor Chuck Smith. And Raul Reese, with murder in his heart and hatred in his soul, got down on his knees and asked God to forgive him. And now Raul is a pastor of a church and God has used him all around the world. So the point is, no one is beyond the reach of God, not even Raul Reese, not even Saul of Tarsus. Later on, when Saul started, started talking to people about Jesus, no one could believe it. Well, is that Saul? Isn't that the Christian killer? And he's talking about his faith in Christ. I mean, this would be like hearing that Richard Dawkins, the atheist, has become a Christian and has just written a new Christian book. You'd say, no way. Or hearing that Howard Stern has turned his radio show into a Bible study show. <laughs> or hearing that Bill Maher started a home Bible study and Lady Gaga is leading worship. <laughs> and Oz Ozzy Osbourne's doing follow up. <laughs> Sounds silly. Sounds incomprehensible. But nothing is impossible with God. God can change you. So here's Saul. He thinks he's on a mission for God. When in reality, he's fighting with God. A light shines in the middle of the day. It blinds him. And he hears a voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul says, who are you, Lord? Here's what he's thinking. Don't say Jesus, don't say Jesus, don't say Jesus. I am Jesus, us, 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 us. Whom you are persecuting. Saul's like, no. Oh! The very God he thought he was serving, he was opposing. You know what his problem was? His religion kept him from God. When it's all said and done, I think religion will probably send more people to hell than all the other sins out there. Now, I know some of you are thinking, what, have you lost your mind, Greg? You're a religious guy, aren't you? I hope not. I have no interest in becoming a religious guy. What is religion? Religion is man's attempt to reach God through ritual, the things that we do. The difference between religion and a relationship with God is religion is man reaching up to God, but Christianity is God reaching down to man through Christ. There's a big difference. Religion says do, do, do this and you'll reach nirvana. Do that and you'll find inner peace. Do this other thing and you might get to heaven. Christianity says done, paid in full at the cross by Jesus Christ because of his shed blood. It's done. <laughs> Maybe you're a religious person. You say, well, Greg, I, I'm, I'm already religious, so? Religion won't get you to heaven. You know the conventional wisdom is good people go to heaven. Well let me correct that conventional wisdom is all dogs go to heaven. We saw that in a movie once. No conventional wisdom is good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell, right? That's not true. <laughs> it can be the reverse of that. Fact of the matter is there's gonna be good people in quotes that will go to hell. And there's gonna be some bad people that go to heaven. You say, you've lost me. Well listen, if that good person thinks they're so good they don't need Jesus Christ, they'll never get to heaven because I don't care who you are, you're not good enough. You still fall short of God's standards. But listen, if that bad person admits their sin and turns from it, Jesus Christ will forgive them just like he forgave the thief on the cross and just like he forgave Saul of Tarsus and just like he forgave Michael Franzese and just like he will forgive you tonight if you will come to him. I think there's gonna be three surprises when we get to heaven. Three surprises. Number one. Some of the people we thought will be there won't be there. 
Number two, some of the people we never thought would be there will be there. And number three, you will be there. Right? So Paul was changed. And you can be changed as well. He had to get rid of his guilt. I talked about that in the beginning. God can remove your sin and thus the guilt that goes along with it will be removed as well. But you have to admit it and you have to ask God to forgive you. You see, Saul of Tarsus heard the voice of Jesus speak to him as he was on his way to hunt down Christians. Maybe you've heard God speak to you tonight. It's not audible, but, but you've sensed that tug deep down inside. Listen, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock, and if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Have you heard his voice? You know, it's interesting. The people that were with Saul heard a noise, but they didn't hear his voice. And here's what I know after doing this for 25 years in stadiums and arenas all around the world. I know that there's nothing I can say or do to make you believe in Jesus. All I know is I can tell you the truth and pray that God's Holy Spirit will open your heart to the truth of what I am saying. And I know that there will be people that will come to an event like this and just blow it off. It's like water off a duck's back. It doesn't penetrate their heart and their reaction is like, yeah, whatever. And then somebody else hears that same message and they get it and they grab it and they ask Christ to come in and their life is changed for time and eternity. All I can do is deliver the news like I pointed out in that little video. I'm just a delivery boy sharing this truth with you. But I'm telling you, God can forgive you right now if you will come to Him. Here's a word of encouragement along with a word of warning given to us by Augustine one of the early church fathers. He said, quote, do not despair, one of the thieves was saved, but do not presume one of the thieves was damned. Does that make sense? Do not despair, one of the thieves was saved. No matter what you've done, God will forgive you if you'll ask him for that forgiveness. But do not presume one of the thieves was damned. Don't say, oh, I don't need to change, I don't need to believe this. You're going to be held accountable for what you know now. It's kind of like getting a call on your cell phone. Did you bring your phone with you tonight? You know, when you get a call, I don't know what kind of phone you have, but on my phone, the name appears on the screen. So I'll get a call. I'll look at it, Kathy Laurie. That's the name of my wife. I go, oh, Kathy Laurie. And I'll always answer it. Almost always. <laughs> but then I call her and if her phone isn't dead because it hasn't been plugged in for a while, or if the ringer is not turned off or it's on mute, she'll answer and then other times she won't answer. I don't know why that is exactly. Think about it this way. You're getting a call. What if you, got, you felt your cell phone buzz, you pick it up, and right there on your phone you read this, Jesus Christ. Whoa, whoa. How did he get my number? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Now you have a decision. You can say accept or decline. You're gonna do one or the other. Accept the call, decline the call. That's the same decision before you right now tonight. Jesus Christ is calling. You have a choice. You can accept it or you can decline it. You can say yes to him or you can say no to him. But this is an either or proposition. Jesus did not say admire me. He said follow me. Jesus Christ is ready to forgive you of all of your sin and change your eternal address from a place called hell to a place called heaven if you will believe in him tonight. And I'm gonna tell you how to do that right now. You might say, all right, Greg, I want my guilt taken away. I want my sin forgiven. I want to go to heaven when I die. What do I need to do? If you haven't listened to anything else I've said, just listen for a few moments, I'm almost done. Listen. Number one, you have to admit you're a sinner. I've already pointed it out, everyone's sinned, all of us have fallen short of God's standards, every one of us have broken God's commandments. Admit you're a sinner, stop making up excuses, just admit it. Number two, recognize that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. See, he went there voluntarily. Those other thieves, those other criminals were there because they had committed crimes. 
Jesus was there because of my crimes and your crimes. Those other thieves could not have gotten off those crosses even if they wanted to. Jesus could have. But listen, it wasn't nails that held Jesus to that cross 2,000 years ago. It was love for you because God loves you. Maybe your parents have not loved you. Maybe others have not loved you. But I want you to know this tonight. God loves you. In fact, Jesus said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says God demonstrated his love toward us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So then you need to repent of your sin. What does that mean? To repent means to change your direction in the road of life. You've been walking away from God. Now it's time to walk toward God. The Bible says repent and be forgiven. The Bible says repent and times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. So you need to turn from that sin and then you need to receive Jesus Christ into your life. I told you already, being a follower of Jesus does not mean you're becoming religious. Being a follower of Jesus means you're asking Christ to come and live inside of you. It means you'll never be alone again and he will walk with you through life. And then when life ends, he'll welcome you into heaven. But you need to receive him. The Bible says, for as many as received him, he gave them the power to become sons of God. You need to say, all right, Lord, come into my life. I accept your call, so to speak. And then he must do it publicly. That is why in a moment I'm gonna ask you to do what almost half a million people have done over the last 25 years in these harvest events. I'm gonna ask you in a few moments if you want Christ to come into your life to get up out of your seat and make your way to this uh, field and stand behind this stage. And as you stand there, you'll be saying publicly, I wanna know God. Jesus said, if you will acknowledge me before people, I will acknowledge you before my Father and the angels in heaven. But he added, if you deny me before people, I'll deny you before the Father and the angels. So I'm gonna ask you to make a public stand. And lastly, you must do it now. Do it now. Don't do it tomorrow. Don't do it in a week. Don't do it in a month. The Bible says, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Tonight is the night. Your life can change. He can do it for you. He did it for Michael Franzese in a prison cell. He can do it for you right here, right now. We're gonna pray in a moment and I'm gonna give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus Christ. So you be thinking about what you're gonna do because every one of us is gonna make a decision right now. Let's all bow our heads and everyone pray if you would if, with me please. Father. Now I pray that your Holy Spirit will help people to see their need for you, help them to come to you and receive the forgiveness that only you can offer. Lord, bring them to yourself. Bring those who have fallen away back to you again. We commit each one now to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen very carefully. If you want your sin forgiven, if you want to know that when you die you will go to heaven, if you want your guilt taken away, or if you've fallen away from the Lord, you want to come back to Him again tonight, I want you, wherever you are, to get up and find your way to the nearest island. Start coming down here to this field. And when you get here, we're going to wait till you all arrive, and then we're going to pray with you and for you. We're going to give you a New Testament to start reading. So you get up and start coming right now. Get up out of your seat and make your way down to this field saying, I want to follow Jesus Christ. Get up and come. If you're a counselor, come. Great to see all of you folks back here, and you have made the most important decision you're ever going to make, and that is the decision to follow Jesus Christ. I'm so glad you came. Congratulations. I'm gonna lead you in a simple word of prayer right now, and I'm gonna ask that you would pray this prayer out loud after me. Again, this is a prayer where you're asking God to forgive you of your sin. You're asking Jesus to be your Savior. Think of it this way. Let's say you were at the beach and you were caught in a riptide, and there's a lifeguard. So you need help, so what do you do? You say, help. 
and the lifeguard comes to help you. The Bible says whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So that's what you're doing in this prayer. You're calling out to Jesus. So again, as I pray, I want you to pray this out loud after me, okay? Let's all bow our heads. Pray this out loud after me right now. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but I know you're a Savior who died on the cross and shed his blood for every sin I've ever committed. I'm sorry for my sin. I turn from that sin now. Forgive me. Remove my guilt. Make me a new person. I choose to follow you from this night forward. Thank you for loving me and accepting me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. God bless all of you. God bless you. Hey, listen, you that just prayed that prayer, we want to give you a Bible that looks like the one I'm holding here. You can see it. It's red with a white arrow. This is the Start Bible. It's a New Testament with some notes that I wrote that will encourage you in this commitment you've made to follow Jesus. We have one for every one of you on the field. Don't leave tonight without your Start Bible. Standing near